Hello and welcome to Film and Game Composers. I'm Mina Shamali, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. John Swihart. He's a film and TV composer hailing from Indiana, and he's based in Los Angeles. He's written the uh, scores for numerous comedy films such as Napoleon Dynamite, Youth and Revolts, and Red Band Society. And you would have heard his work for over nine years on the hit show How I Met Your Mother, among several other TV comedies. His latest film is Staten Island Summer, produced by SNL creator Lorne Michaels, and which was released, recently released through Netflix. Hello, John. Hello. Nice to meet you, man. So, nice before you started writing music for, for film and TV, you were playing with the Blue Man Group, uh, working as a studio session musician, remixing for DJs. Seems you've had a pretty interesting life up to and including your composing career. So what's the story of John Swihart's? Oh, that's... I guess it took me a while to figure out that composing was the most fun thing to do. I went to, I grew up in the Midwest in Indiana, um, played piano and guitar, and I went to Berkeley College of Music and sort of bummed around and played in bands for years and uh, eventually started putting studios together, did commercials in Boston for a while, and uh, I sort of knew I had to get out of Boston. Um, and uh, Eventually, I got hired in Blue Man Group, and that was sort of my parachute to the West Coast. I got hired in the Vegas show, and I worked in that show for a year in L.A. and just started scoring every little indie project I could. And after four or five years, I got in a full one. And then after that, I've been that guy that did that thing, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a, you know, you need a hit to sort of sell yourself after that. But that's how I got on How I Met Your Mother, and that was all happened at the same time. And then How I Met Your Mother took off. And basically, been busy ever since the fall. Nice. Uh, let's talk about Staten Island Summer, your latest project. So this is a coming of age comedy, seemingly about a massive lifeguard party, and the shenanigans that follow. At least based on the trailer. You know, what's the film about, and how do you end up in the composer role there? Um, I'm, I have a good relationship with the music supervisor, Mark Weick. He, uh, he thought I would be a good fit and made the introduction uh, to Reese. He introduced me to the director, Reese Thomas, and uh, it worked out. They uh, decided to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, we worked on it for a while. That movie actually took... It ended up getting spread out because Reese also directs SNL. So there was a period where I got hired in March and then he had to crunch for the end of the season there and we sort of took a break for a few months and they went and did some reshoots and then uh, we got sort of back together in August and continued. And that's really where we did the meat of the project, even though it, it didn't dub until February. So it was almost a year. Oh, wow. So we worked on the project, but it was sort of piecemeal. It was like you know really busy in August, September, October, and then not so busy until we were getting ready to really wrap it up. Oh, I see. How early in the, produ in the product production process were you actually involved, though? Was it, it before the, sh product even, the project even shot? No. They had already shot it. They put it together. You know, they had a good idea of what they wanted to do, where they wanted to go musically, and then that's when I got brought in. But they wanted to do reshoots, and he had all of these SNL episodes he had to deal with, and and uh, even when we got close to the finish line, they had that 40th anniversary in it uh, so that he had to really focus on for a couple of weeks. He just kind of vanished. But, uh, you know, so it was uh, it was on again, off again a little bit, unlike a lot of other projects where you have you know three weeks or six weeks to score. Yeah, just, this was more of a key mm -hmm. schedule. I see. And so what was the vision that they came to you, the film, the director and maybe the producers? Did, it, did they have something very specific in mind or was it more give and take? What, what happened there? I don't know if it was really worked out before I got there. We had, you know, they, they definitely liked the idea of this place being a place that was sort of stuck in time. So we had a lot, a lot of that sort of 70s vibe stuff was already in there in some temp places and it was obviously working with Chuck, the main sort of nemesis in the film. It really suit him and his mustache well. <laughs> um, 
but uh, a, a lot of the other stuff was we had to figure out. We ended up with a pretty traditional sort of score in on some of the more emotional stuff. A lot of strings and piano, a lot of pizzicato stuff because it's a comedy, you know, sort of. Yeah. But uh, we didn't want it to sound like a little indie darling, you know, movie. So you know, the acoustic guitar stuff is pretty well buried. <laughs> um, you know, we wanted it to sound, you know, like a like a real studio film. So wow. we couldn't get too rinky dink with it. <laughs> but uh, so we had actually some of the themes came we came up with on guitar, but then got orchestrated with orchestra. And then... That's sweet. And obviously, a large portion of the score is the '70s style funk. You've also infused this with with a few other things. And the thing about comedy on film and TV is that it seems to have a rather unique musical edge because you can't just put a comedic piece of music these days, uh, just expect it to pass because it could be kind of, you know, passe or cliche and almost as undesirable by directors as Mickey Mousing. Uh, sometimes yeah. it's more about context. And so you could put Barber's Adagio for strings on top of something and it could turn out really <laughs> hilarious if you got the right scene. <laughs> so I've listened right. to, the, to, the, to the excellent soundtrack and so you get to do quite a bit of that, this, this whole playing with different genres depending on context. And some of these could easily be at home for an action in an action film, for instance, you know what I mean? So Yeah, we had a couple of moments like that. Yeah, so like maybe t- tell us a bit more about that whole genre jumping that you get to do. In the well, film. we're just trying to, you know, fit what... We're just trying to tell the story, so it's really what whatever the scene needs. That the, There was one scene where... Uh, Frank, the redheaded kid, goes to uh, save a drowning boy in the pool. I think that may have been one of the most difficult cues to figure out. We tried to approach it a bunch of different ways, but ended up with this sort of... We ended up using one of our themes, but we sort of made the theme big orchestral, and it sort of had... It also had like this, a little bit of this 70s vibe to it at one point we had music from rocky cut in there and that was that seemed to be the funniest thing to do um but it was way too you know it was just too rocky you know there was no way we could get away from that so it wasn't you know it wasn't sports music but it was big orchestral sort of action packed but it still had our theme and it still had you know it had to sort of feather into a joke at the very end we didn't really punctuate that many jokes, yeah. Um, like you do in comedy, sometimes you definitely punctuate moments, but we didn't want it to be like another Thirty Rock type of thing where we're actually hitting all the jokes, and, you know, making making the music a gag itself. Yeah, we, we just wanted to support the story and sort of we were just trying to make sure make sure it had a foundation that was strong enough to communicate to the audience what we wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, because you play a lot of the instruments on your own scores, uh, but I think you also brought in, uh, brought in other instrumentalists to play some, uh, uh, some stuff. So, so, you know, who's involved, what was involved in doing that? The guy that had the biggest effect on this score is probably uh, the percussionist that we had. He's a, he played drum kit and he played bongos on all the, really sort of kitschy 70s stuff and it really contributed a huge amount he played taiko drums on the uh, i don't know if you remember the scene where uh frank is trying to score a joint to impress a girl <laughs> and uh we had this taiko drum thing for all the sort of danger elements of yeah. the score uh, so he played he performed all of that but really the bongos and the 70s stuff was really sort of the big and i heard some some african inspired things as well yeah we we yeah for the lion talk or, yeah <laughs> yeah that, that was fun uh, that scene was out that scene was out for a while i was really happy when it came back <laughs> uh it's and it seems the process was uh, was a lot of fun for you and and i'm hoping for the rest of the uh, the cast and crew yeah, comedy is comedy is always fun because you're laughing all day, you know, or at least you have a reason to laugh, even when you're, you know, grinding away on this yeah. stuff. It's, uh, it's fun, you know. You're not. I've worked on some heavy dramas, you know, about dead babies or whatever, and 
you know, I'm Yikes. going out to seven eleven. I'm getting cigarettes and smoking all day, you know, so that doesn't <laughs> happen on these kinds of projects. Oh wow. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, keeping with the comedy, uh in your TV, in the T V world, uh over your nine years of work of how, on How I Met Your Mother, you get to do a lot of that genre experimentation. And the thing is, How I Met Your Mother seems to be a particularly unique four-camera sitcom because it allowed a lot more scope for music in the way it was styled, in the way it was shot, in the way it was, it was created, and it was told. Uh, and so there's a lot of fun suspense scenes and action and running and a lot of emotional cues uh, as well because it's, you know, it's a big love story. Uh, and not to mention the the original songs that get incorporated into the show. So how's that whole How Many Mother experience for you, being that it is such a unique sitcom? It was an amazing experience. And the, the guys that are the creators of the show, Carter and Craig, they, they are very musical. They actually, all those songs, the Robin Sparkles songs, for example, <laughs> yeah. they they actually write those songs themselves. They, they had a band when they were... Uh, in college and they still write music they're actually writing a musical now oh nice but they would send me they'd send me little clips you know little phone video clips of them playing guitar and singing the song and then i would have to turn it into a piece that would fit with the picture and mm. you know we'd go back and forth that was the song production part of it but they they are such a uh, they're both librarians of music they're so well versed in all different kinds of music and they would have very specific ideas for instance there's an episode where ted become gets a job as a professor so they want to do and his friends buy him a hat and a whip and we're making indiana jones music you know yeah. for an episode and then they would do all kinds of things that would sort of jump off of you know very established forms of entertainment you know that are all that we all love and so they they were really good at doing that just as writers and making that work well and the cast was obviously amazing as well but uh, they were also you know i know it was a multi-cam show but it had a lot of single cam work in it it's really a it was really a hybrid show yeah and they also use music for that big emotional moment you know 17 minutes in that sort of moral of the story moment in the mm -hmm. in the show they you know they would always talk about some of the old sitcoms of the 80s that were really really uh big and they would have the same sort of structure for this show where they would have this sort of life lesson in the in the show about 17 18 minutes in and we you know i'd get to write a minute and a half long cue or some mm -hmm. big emotion thing so that's really unusual for a half hour multi camera comedy. So yeah. I've, I've done a few of them, and most of them are just, you know, bumpers. I uh, see. And that that's what I, what I tend to find is, is very unique about the show is that it, inc it does have the capacity to incorporate that. Uh, it's really the creators, they, they're just very good at using music. So I, they gave me a lot of room to, to write music for them. So it was a really great. Mm -hmm. honor to do that and a lot of fun to work on obviously <laughs> and they're just a great group of people wonderful and so with the with the original songs you were saying that it was them that wrote it so something like nothing suits me like a suit you know barney's big musical number uh, so how much is it how much is it them and then how much is it you is it so they write the whole thing and send it to you and then you produce it or do you kind of get a lot of input into that what's going on there they would they would write the whole all the words are theirs they would write all the music basically but you know they would send me a video of them playing acoustic guitar yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the, how the song would go and then we would orchestrate it and you know set it up for that we and we went to east west and recorded a full orchestra for that and that, that was a lot of fun but oh, you know lovely. we had to you know, we had to orchestrate it for our orchestra and then, you know, there we'd send them some demos and we'd go back and forth and, you know, make mm -hmm. some choices and and then we'd you know, get it done, basically. <laughs> <laughs> nice. East West is uh that's the East West Studios in LA you mean? Yes. Yeah, I've I've been there. It's pretty it's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty great. awesome. Great great uh, we actually recorded Staten Island got recorded there too. Actually. Oh lovely. Lovely. In the same room. They're a great group of guys over there too. That room sounds amazing. I didn't, yeah. you know, when we got the tracks back from there, I was really impressed with 
just the the room the way that room sounds mm. it was Absolutely. I noticed that some of the cues in, uh, tend to surface in different episodes to great effect. For example, the doppelganger's tango, which is one of my f personal favorite cues. Uh, were you still having to, to basically score every single episode of How I Met Your Mother, or had you built up enough of a library of cues that, you know, there were episodes where you could get by without ever having to compose a single note? Well... And just kind of music edit the that, whole thing? No, you can't really do that. Like, but... The, the editor who won three Emmys, I think, for that show, by the way, yeah. she's fan she was fantastic. She's actually a musician. She's a violinist who used to play in uh, a pit orchestra. Uh, she's played all over the place, but she used to play in uh, the Opera House in, uh, I think, in San Francisco. But she's phenomenal with music, too. So she would she would do a great job of bringing these themes back. Like it was all very intuitive to these, to everybody that was there yeah. before I even got involved or would come in and spot the episode, which is also unusual for a multi-camera. I would go sit with them and spot every episode, but uh, you still have to rework it for the scene. Like even if I could open up an old session, sometimes a lot of times it's easier just to recreate it again. Yeah. Uh, is if the tempos change or you want the key to change so it it works better with what's coming next or what just came before it you know you have to sort of figure that out once in a while we could actually reuse the original but yeah. more often than not i would be just remaking it it would take just as long to remake it as it would to try and open up an old session so you've done a lot of comedy from napoleon dynamite all the way from back then to accidental love earlier this year and obviously staten island uh, Staten Island Summer. Is it the people who approach you that seek out your expertise in working with comedy, or is it something that you deliberately look out for because you particularly enjoy it? I've been really fortunate. Uh, um, you know, well, the way Hollywood works is if once you've done something well, people are confident that you can do that. So people end up coming to you for the same thing more often than not. So I, a lot of people do come to me for comedy, and that's great. And a lot of times it's stuff that's a little bit off kilter. You know, it's gonna, it's got to be a little bit more interesting than the usual yeah. stuff. Um. So in in that respect, I've been really fortunate, and doing comedy is a lot of fun. Um, you know, I like to do other stuff too. Yeah. Even if it does drive me to <laughs> smoke. <laughs> but uh. You know, variety is nice, um, so it's it's all fun. Yeah, and you obviously know how to switch gears effortlessly. Uh, you know, you've done these other genres like drama and a bit of thriller, even though sometimes they're mixed with comedy as well. But you know, is there something? Is that something you'd like to do more of as well? Is the uh, things that are exclusively non-comedic? I was thinking about this the other day. I don't. I don't think I've ever worked on anything that had a gun in it. <laughs> <laughs> how how about your mother had Robin, who was a gun oh, enthusiast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, all right, FBI, I don't know. No, it'd be fun. It would be great to do those shows. I'm, a, I'm obsessed with electronic music, so, you know, I'm loving what Matt Quayle is doing with uh, Mr. Robot, that kind of technology-driven yeah. stuff. I love watching that stuff. I'm pretty nerded out, too. I'm, um, you know, I'm all PC over here, and, Yes. Well, I was actually gonna gonna ask you just about your setup. You're because you're a multi instrumentalist and you perform on many of, the, of your own scores. So, what instruments do you have in play? And you know, what what are your studio toys and gadgets? What, what's what's your sound world like? Uh, well, I think if you ask my wife, she'd say it's a big junkyard. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I have a big collection of analog keyboards uh, but I probably have almost every synth plug-in too I probably have too much stuff to be honest sometimes it's overwhelming but but I, I actually am comfortable being surrounded by stuff uh, some guys like to have a very sparse workspace they just want their computer monitor and a keyboard but yeah but I actually enjoy the sort of interaction it depends on the project. You know, some projects are driven by guitar. Some of them are driven by piano or keyboard related stuff. Some are driven by percussion. I have a live room with a drum kit set up and two mm -hmm. pianos. Um, and I can still fit 12 string players in there. I have a oh, wow. collection 
a collection of guitar amps in there um, and a bass amp uh, of an old flip top. Um, you know, I sort of keep try and keep my bases covered. I have a lot of guitars. I'm sort of at the point where I don't want to buy any more. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm tired of I'm tired of changing strings. But uh, do you have to do but, that often? Uh, <laughs> I don't even do it that often, but when just something about looking at all the guitars makes me think about changing strings. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'll change if I if a guitar is suited for a project, I'll end up, you know, refreshing the strings on that. But sometimes you can't tell if it's suited for it until yeah. that. But sometimes it's more obvious. It's always different, but Sounds like you've had a few gig nightmares where you've just played so many gigs that you had to change strings every gig. You're like, I don't want to do that anymore. I think everybody who's played a lot live has had plenty of gig nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> lot of that. Yeah, I don't want to get into that right now. No, nah, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> uh, and I suppose finally, what's your life like, you know, outside of the studio and outside of music? I don't get outside the studio enough. I, uh, I live right up the street from where I work. So I walk to work, which is a really cush sort of situation for yeah. Los Angeles. Um, I have three kids. I'm married. Wonderful. Dealing with school systems. I like to surf when I can, but I really haven't gone out. I really have no business being out there anymore. I, <laughs> like once, I go once a year now. But, um, you know, I get out and go for hikes. We live in the hills, in Hollywood Hills, so I oh, hike nice. a lot. Yeah. It's lovely. I don't really do much other than work, but I love my job, so. <laughs> but you what? sorry? What was the last sentence? I love my job, so it's, and I don't that, mind working all the time, which is what I do. And that's always a beautiful thing, being able to make a living doing what you love. John Swihart, thank you very much for the, uh, for chatting with us and for this lovely, this lovely uh, interview. I've definitely enjoyed myself. I hope you have as well. And... Uh, and Staten Island Summer is now on Netflix. Uh, the soundtrack, is it available online uh, for purchase? I believe it is, yes. Yes. Uh, found it on Amazon. Uh, I don't know if it's on iTunes. It probably uh, is. Probably is. Uh, so yeah, so look for the Staten Island Summer soundtrack online. And uh, John, thank you so much. We will uh, see you later. All right, be good.